techniques and physics of weather and climate. Um, yeah, meteorology. Yeah, at least when I started, uh, there was no clear distinction between general circulation and climate. Uh, both were the province of knowing what the fluid mechanical equations and the thermodynamic equations, radiative transfer, were telling you. And Professor, what was your association with the IPCC? Well, uh, the first two I was involved with remotely, you know, as a, an author, contributing author, a reviewer, but I finally decided uh, on the third one, I might as well see what was really going on. So I agreed to be a uh, lead author. And what that meant is you attended the meetings and uh, worked on, it sounds absurd, uh, you worked on maybe three pages of a multi-thousand page document. And for this, you sort of traveled around the earth several times including once in New Zealand. <laughs> All right. And your work was one of the chapters then in what Assessment Report 3, AR3. Yes. It, it, yeah. It was on the physics, uh, physical processes, and we were looking at the uh, water vapor and clouds and the hydrological cycle and its contribution to feedbacks it was about three pages, four pages. I, I think it was fairly honest. It said, you know, the models at that point and to the present really couldn't handle it. We're doing a very poor job on the clouds and so on. Uh, there was a little bit of pressure not to be too critical of models, but, you know, we also agreed we wouldn't say anything that was overtly false. So was that chapter in the end severely edited before it was published or did it go out into the no, world no, as you wrote it, it? No, you have to understand it was pretty much as we wrote it. Uh, you know, this is something that's often misunderstood about the IPCC. The IPCC has many components and uh, the propagandists and the environmentalists speak of it as a single thing, but, but it really isn't. It has, first of all, three working groups. Working group one is the science. Working group two, I think, was mitigation, and the other was impacts, or maybe I have them reversed, impacts and then policy. But the one on the science is actually kind of straight. As I say, it has a bias, but it often, you know, like AR5 saying, you know, there's no trend in hurricanes, no trend in droughts, no trend in floods. It, it acknowledges all those things, but it's clear it's not meant to be read. It doesn't even have an index, and it's written in a rather obtuse language. Uh, then you have, you know, the summary for policymakers that is a little bit selective and really designed to be propagandistic. And um, occasionally it happens that, you know, they have this, had this funny rule that uh, the summary uh, pre preceded the document and the document could be revised to be consistent with the summary. So that's where you begin to get dicey. <laughs> and then the least, finally yes. <laughs> the press... <laughs> yeah, uh, and then there's the uh, iconic press release. My impression is that nobody reads the document. Hardly anyone even reads the summary because, you know, it's scientific. And the iconic statement will be something like, you know, we're now pretty sure that most of the warming over the last 50 years is due to man. What people don't realize is that statement says nothing, even if it's true. Because if the warming over the last uh, 50 years has not been great, uh, then uh, if man's, you know, responsible for 51%, that could mean there's no problem, because it's rather small. Uh, and so they leave it at that, and then they leave it to the politicians and the environmentalists to say things like in the U.S., Senators Lieberman and McCain said, well, now we have the smoking gun, we must do something. And, of course, that's absurd, 
but uh, the nasty part of this is the scientists never complain that they're being misinterpreted. All right. Can you then tell us about the science? First question, is the climate changing? And second question, is it being well, caused it by greenhouse <laughs> gases, especially CO2? Well, you know, the answer to the first question is, of course, climate has always changed over, you know, four and a half billion years. So that, that's a non-starter. Uh, that's the nature of the system. As to the role of CO2, it looks like it's relatively small, and it doesn't seem like it was a major factor in any past climate change. So what about other greenhouse Some of which gases? Was pretty profound. Yeah. What about other GHGs like, oh, uh, even... like like methane? And what's this one we've heard about recently called SF6, which is actually used, ironically, in the manufacture of wind turbines. So how relevant are they? Oh, yeah. Totally irrelevant. I mean, you know, this is a joke. Methane, yes, uh, it, it, there's so much less of methane and then CO2 and it's masked by other chemicals, its impact is fairly minimal, you know, a small fraction of a degree at most. But uh, they claim that each molecule is more important than a CO2 molecule. Well, the, even that isn't particularly true. It's a little bit true, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not enough to make a difference. But on the other hand, this gives them a handle on the agricultural sector. You can close down cattle and so on. Tell us about so, that. Yeah, it's happening in New Zealand at this time. I know. And in the quest for power, of course, that's very attractive. But there's no way, even if the whole world shut down its uh, methane production, that that would impact climate. Uh, Professor, we keep on being told, especially, excuse me, in the last few years, that these years, particularly since 2012, are, are the warmest on record. Now, is that true? And <laughs> is it the start of a trend? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> you know, how should I put it? Uh, you know, I, that, that's such an obvious, that should be legally prohibited as false, you know, misleading advertising. You know, in 98, you know, we don't have a very long record of temperature, but 1998 was an El Nino year. It was it was warmer than probably was the warmest year in the instrumental record. And after that, the temperature has no discernible trend. You know, it goes up and down a little. It always fluctuates a little. And you did have an El Nino, I think, in 1914. 2014, 2016, but then temperature went up and then down again. But let's say in 98, the temperature had just remained absolutely static, never changed a bit, not that we could measure that. Then you could say all the years since 1998 have been the hottest years on record, couldn't you? <laughs> yes. So when did this uh, so-called climate crisis become politicized and why do you think this happened i think you know it's been pushed for 30 years and uh it's the longest lasting of all the uh scare problems you know whether it was acid rain or global cooling or population or anything and i have the feeling that the people who are promoting this feel if they can't get this through uh, now, they never will. And so, you know, there's this desperate push to take advantage of the popular uh, misunderstanding of this issue uh, to, you know, grab power. So it's effectively being driven by the political left, isn't it? At this point, that seems to be the case. You know, the left is essentially committed to state power. The state is best suited, according to them, to determine the economy. And to do that, you know, as we saw after World War II in the UK, the obvious temptation was to nationalize various large sectors of the economy. Uh, in most of the world, uh, they've realized this didn't work and they've privatized, but the aim never disappeared, and taking over the energy sector is, you know, kind of dream. 
Well, in New Zealand at the moment, Professor, we have a zero carbon bill, uh, which is in our parliament going through the process. The aim is to have the country net carbon zero in 31 years by 2050. What would you tell our politicians if you were submitting to them on that legislation? Well, I would certainly ask them, uh, would they feel uh, good if they could reduce the amount of CO2 from per million to 150? And you know why I'd ask that? Yeah, I, I know the answer, but would they? Well, you could explain to them that, you know, that would get rid of all their problems. There'd be no life on Earth anymore, or at least no advanced life. No plants, no animals. So is that number of 400 ppm, does that actually mean anything at all? Well, yeah, it's a number. It's the, you know, contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere. It's maybe 410 by now, 405 parts per million. You know, CO2 is really rather important, but mainly in a positive sense. It's, you know, plant fertilizer. It's, you know, it does good things. It's not a pollutant. It's not poisonous. And the space station, they allow, uh, you know, 5,000 parts per million. Same thing in atomic submarines. Uh, none of that is considered dangerous. Uh, Professor, I've read a lot about you online. Uh, you're the subject, it, it seems, <laughs> uh, of that very common pushback uh, by people who don't like your views. They say you are funded by the fossil fuel industry. Now, I have to ask you straight up, have you been paid uh, by oil or coal or by mining interests at any stage outside your academic career? Well, you know, I did take pay for being a, uh, an expert witness for uh, Peabody Coal. It's normal. I don't know of anyone who does this without pay. None of my research is that has ever been supported by the fossil fuel industry. In fact, all such funding as I've ever had has always been from the U.S. government. What's your current relationship then with uh, your former college, uh, MIT? Do they uh, buy what you are saying about this issue, or are you ostracized well, from your academic institution? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, you know, this issue is not uh, the main issue of research at the institution, to be honest. And within my field, dynamics and physics of the atmosphere, I'm still, you know, the students still come to me. I'm still emeritus. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, I still have reasonable relations with colleagues. The administration of the university is another story. They've made climate a major issue and they're concerned with student activists and they're forever pressuring people. It's, it's also the case. I'm retired and I'm a theoretician. So I really never needed much in the way of funding. And at the moment I have none. Uh, but if you're still active in the field, if you're a young scientist, yeah, I have to say, I, I understand if you question this issue, you lose your funding and you can't publish, in which case your career is over. And that, surely, in the field of science, is extraordinary, isn't it? Because isn't science supposed is. to be about continually asking questions? Absolutely, absolutely. There are some examples similar in other fields, but I won't go into that. Uh, every field, especially since peer review has come in. Peer review is primarily something of the post-World War II period. And while people think of it as, you know, certifying work, it actually is a mode of pressuring conformity in many respects. I mean, it is true that peer review properly done, you know, will weed out things that probably shouldn't be published, but it also obviously has the danger of suppressing uh, any sort of deviations from uh, the common view. And just finally, Professor, next Friday, our time a week from today, the 27th of September, there's going to be marches all over New Zealand by 
particularly uh, high Children. school <laughs> high school students. We'll yeah. we'll give them. Uh, uh, that classification today and university students and in New Zealand the wider community too is being asked to march climate strike is it, is climate it, strike it, for action I think it's called yeah so what is the yeah. point of that it, it sounds a little bit like uh, the cultural revolution in the red guards and so on I, I think it, it, it's just bizarre that people who know nothing about the subject uh, are sort of treating it as uh, existential threat and, you know, you must do something as though, and, you know, the irony of it is they're, they're proposing things that would have no impact on climate, regardless of what you believe, even if you believe the models. So, you know, they're being asked, you know, to. it's a little bit like going back to, you know, these primitive Mayan and Aztec religions where they would, uh, you know, placate the gods by sacrificing humans and things like that, symbolic gestures. It's everywhere, kind of yeah. crazy. Yeah. Although you will have noticed polls, and it's worth thinking about, that, you know, almost everywhere, a majority of the respondents regard this as not an important issue. This is an issue that belongs to two groups, and I don't know why, it's what we might call the educated elite and the younger, you know, the millennials and post-millennials who've been thoroughly indoctrinated in schools. That's a dangerous situation. I hope that the majority that holds sane views will be, you know, empowered to say stop. Because, uh, you know, this is getting out of hand, as you say. Good luck. <laughs>